forward services to to more than uh, one and a half million uh, customers. Uh, and and we're really excited to hear uh, Rajdeep's perspective on how they've built their traction in the space. Uh, Rajdeep himself has over six years of management consulting experience in uh, the financial services sector. Uh, he, he has expertise in the strategy, operations, digital, digital and transformational space. So really invite the students on the call today to really pick his brains on, on how he's furthered his career in the space and what, what it really takes to excel. Uh, he's also got extensive experience of working with banks, NBFCs, payments, uh, small finance bank, microfinance, so across the DFS sector in that sense. Uh, so we are really excited to have you and welcome, welcome Rajdeep to this uh, session. Um, before you. I hand it over to Rajdeep, just, just a couple of quick housekeeping rules and then Rajdeep, I'll, we'll, we'll pass on the, the presentation rights to you all. So for those of you who, who, who are new to this WebEx platform, uh, the way we do this is we try to make this as interactive as possible. So Rajdeep will cover the core concepts uh, through a few slides that he has. Um, and, and then after that, we'll open up uh, the session to your questions. So uh, please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A feature that's available in the WebEx. So if you're logged in through your computer, you'll be able to see a black button with three dots with a Q&A option. So please click on that, and then you will get an option to type in your, your question through a chat window. But do uh, choose all panelists so that we can see your questions. What we'll do is we'll, uh, I will take your questions, and, and uh, depending on the, the appropriate time, uh, pose that to Rajiv and get his perspective. So please don't hesitate to, to write in. Uh, of course, we already got a list of questions, and, and uh, uh, Rajdeep and us have already gone through uh, some of the, the key themes. So you may find that some of your questions are already answered. But please don't hesitate to come in and, and make this as interactive as possible. Uh, right, that's about it. Um, without much further ado, uh, over to you, Rajdeep, and welcome again. Glad to have you. Thank you so much, Abhinesh, for your kind introduction. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, all the attendees and uh, uh, you know the experts from PwC uh, who have been kind enough to host me and Neo uh, in this forum. Uh, so he already gave a quick introduction. So I'll just tell a little bit more about Neo, and then we'll start the content uh, for the open banking class today. So Neo, uh, you can say, is actually the first open bank or a Neo bank that uh, was started in India. Uh, even though the concept has been popular uh, in the West, uh, particularly in UK. Germany, uh, US, uh, and few other countries. So, in a new bank or open bank is very simply put a digital banking platform that uh, tries to separate the banking products and the banking distribution and the customer experience. Right. So, Raju, so sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Raju. Just, just one sec. We, uh, we've handed over the presentation registry. So, whenever you're ready, you can also present. Okay. Registry. Okay. Perfect. So, I think it, uh, I'll start uh, presenting the content and then you can. Uh, have a broader discussion. Yeah, is it visible? Abhish? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Sorry, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah. So we'll start off with uh, basically an introduction about new banking or open banking, what it is all about, how uh, this concept came to uh, its existence, and, and then we'll jump into uh, some of the details in terms of the business model. Right. Uh, so, as I was saying, right, in, in, you will come across these terms like an open bank, challenger bank, new bank, all of them basically means the same thing, right? Uh, so, that it's an evolved form of a fintech, uh, so to speak. So, earlier we had fintech startups who were specialized in, say, payments or lending or insurance. So, they would pick up one area and then they would uh, be specialized in that. So, new bank is more like a digital banking platform, uh, which aims to uh, sort of take all the banking products and services, bundle it, unbundle it, and then offer it through a digital and a mobile platform. So the term was first coined in 2017, but there are uh, new bank or uh, similar startups in existence for the last five, six years. Uh, some of the more popular ones, we'll cover them in detail later. You would, must have heard about Revolut, Monzo, or N26. So they are very large new banks today in uh, UK, Germany, uh, some in in US and Australia, right? So new banking basically means banking beyond physical worlds. So there is no concept of any branch or any big uh, setup or a lot of uh, people on the ground. It is all about uh, having a bank in at your uh, palm, right? So you just need a mobile app and you get all your banking services then and there. Many of you might think that okay, we already have a mobile banking app. So what's new about new banking? Right, what's so different? So we'll cover that also uh, later. So neobanks basically identify a certain target market, 
or a certain customer segment and they try to solve their problems day to day needs in a way that is much better than what a bank would do right so new banks uh, would say that uh, they are very simple affordable uh, their service offering is very simple to understand the pricing is very transparent and the entire experience is enjoyable you would not have a uh, lot of this friction points or uh, you know issues related to a lot of paperwork confusion you won't have all of that the experience should be as simple as ordering something on amazon or watching a movie on netflix so that's the holy grail that new banks are targeting they want to make your banking experience like ordering a cab on uber or watching something on netflix so in a snapshot this is what new banking is about right the customer is at the center everything is built around the customer and everything is more or less built on a mobile app right so i put a customer in the middle of a mobile app right it has to be very intuitive and interactive the experience uh, it is not the experience is not the same for everyone we try to tailor it tailor made it for different customers the interface is mobile uh, it, it has to be very seamless user friendly the account opening process we target to make it very fast paperless presentless you don't have to visit anywhere nobody needs to come to your house you should be able to open an account within 5 minutes or 10 minutes at your home the pri pricing has to be very transparent uh, you know it's simple one or two price points so all of us have bank accounts and if we go and check your terms and conditions sheet in in your savings account you would see it runs into two three pages and there are so many terms that you find it very confusing right so that's the kind of problems that new banks are trying to solve right they make the pricing very simple many of the pricing is uh, subscription based like how a lot of us have uh, amazon prime subscription or a netflix subscription new banks globally are trying to build a pricing like that that you subscribe to a certain plan and then everything else is free uh, as i said earlier the customers uh, feel understood they will cater to they feel that you know something has been built for them Uh, so there are different customer uh, value propositions or different sort of uh, what we call use cases many of you might have heard this term uh, so new bank doesn't try to solve everything for everyone that is simply not possible that's what maybe an hdfc bank or sbi might want to do but when a fintech startup uh, is created they try to pick and choose certain segments and their problem statements and that's what we have seen globally and we have seen in india also we'd cover some indian new banks later here i've tried to give some examples of use cases and problem statements now the first one let's say cross border travel payments this is what we at neo have a product for uh, so if you travel abroad and you try to pay using your credit card or your debit card you have to uh, pay a very large forex markup right around 3 to 4% and then if you lose your card you have to uh contact your bank your customer care number and you will incur uh, you know isd charges and then you won't have any other means by which you can make the payment right uh, you don't know how much is getting charged to you what is the conversion rate it is a very slightly uh, cumbersome and uh, challenging process i am say similarly let's move to the next use case uh, small businesses and smes uh, they find it very difficult to manage their uh, books of accounts their you know payments receivables they don't have access to uh, working capital or other business loans because large banks typically don't want to uh, you know bank uh, so much with them they would ask for so much documentation and proofs which might not be possible uh, for an sme to provide uh, and uh, big businesses use accounting softwares like tally or they would use uh, softwares from microsoft uh, right sap but small businesses they manage everything on excel uh, they all their money they are paying they are receiving they somebody actually manages it on pen and paper and excel and then to reconcile that at the end of the month is very difficult so there are new banks who are trying to solve it uh, right uh, they want uh, to bring everything on a mobile app or a web platform and then the bank account lies at the base so everything gets accounted for in your account then uh, today we have so many uh gig economy workers right your delivery boys from amazon swiggy and zomato uber drivers they also have banking needs right but it is again difficult for them to get an account open in, in sbi or hdfc bank or let's say an uber driver wants to take a loan and purchase his own car he was driving for someone else today he would find it very difficult and he might get a loan at a very high interest rate 
so these are the real life problems that uh, you know exist today in india as i said uh, either uh, working classes blue collar employees or gig economy workers right somebody who is uh, a freelancer let's say somebody who is a freelance consultant he will find it very difficult to get a home loan today in india because he is not salaried so these kind of customer segments exist whose problems are not very well understood by banks and that's why the opportunity lies for new banks to build something for them any questions so far so that's we just covered the basics of new banking we'll get into how it has evolved um so yeah there, there is one question where there is a, a person has spoken about what is the process for depositing cash in the new bank account but i think that's something you'll we'll possibly cover down the line yeah um, yeah but let's let's take a minute to answer so most new yeah. banks today uh, they are moving away from cash completely they don't want to get in the hassle of uh, somebody in operations or sales managing cash so they will give you an option to cash out so you, they will provide most new banks will provide you a debit card you can use it at atm and get the cash but deposit has to be online so we heavily encourage uh, deposit into the account through either imps or upi or net banking uh, i don't know of any new bank in india that is accepting cash as deposit because then a lot of regulations come in and then a lot of operational risk come in and you have to manage audits and all of that i hope that answers the query yep perfect okay. we'll move into the evolution of new banking so as i said the concept is about 5 years old today and atom bank in uk was actually one of the first ones uh, they have got a banking license as have gone uh, revolut and monzo also have gone so the regulator in uk is actually one of the most progressive ones they have created a lot of frameworks around open banking api banking and they have been uh, very proactive in providing guidelines and providing uh, digital banking licenses now in the last one year we have also seen singapore and hong kong this uh, regulators opened up to the idea of providing digital banking licenses and people have applied um there are today more than uh, 40 50 active new banks uh, that are large enough right i'm not really counting the small startups that are maybe seed funded or angel funded but really big well funded new banks uh, with more than 40 50 today uh, there are uh, big examples in uk as i said revolut monzo atom there is n26 based out of germany uh, all of them have european licenses as well because the regulator in uk is ecb so uh, once you get a license in one european country you can work in the eurozone uh, except uk of course then we have new bank which is brazil based very large there is neat based out of hong kong uh, other new bank specialized ones like chime Uh, it's there in us zinja in australia so uh, in those economies uh, those countries where the regulator is very uh, progressive and proactive we saw the first wave of new banks getting started there so this is a uh, snapshot of the market size and how this is growing a lot of sort of expansion exponentially right last year the market size was expected 27 billion dollars but it is expected to grow to up to 400 billion dollars in about the next 6 years which accounts to cagr of more than 40 45% right so globally we can say 39 million uh, sort of customers that exist today right our four crores and uh, 10% of that would be in india uh, as you can see it is a minuscule percentage of the total bankable customers right today the market size is 3 4 million but it can potentially grow up to you know 20 25 million uh, in the next 5 years a lot of this by the way is taken from a uh, thought leadership from pwc itself on new banking so the takeaway from here is it is really growing at a exponentially much much faster than the banking industry or the overall world economic growth rate so some of the large names i have uh, taken here uh, right and the snapshot here is that big banks have been very slow to adopt new technologies Uh, they have a lot of legacy systems so even though they came out with mobile banking apps but for them it was more like an extension of their existing product existing technology they did not build anything from scratch and that's why these uh, large new banks you talk about revolut monzo and 26 they took the opportunity and they acquired more than million customers a lot of them uh, most of them have uh, millions and millions of customers today 
they have got bank licenses so they are accepting deposits as well as you can see revolut has 7 million customers mondo has 3.1 and 6.5 uh, new bank in brazil is actually very large brazil is a large economy it's 12 million customers and most of them are now expanding internationally like revolut has ex already expanded in singapore switzerland us and it is in the process of expanding in india as well monzo has done a pilot in us already uh, n26 is there in most european countries and uh, one big highlight here is that unlike other tech startups which initially have very low monetization they they are trying to get uh, customers right? their primary metric becomes customer acquisition or volume throughput new banks have a very good uh, route to monetization they they can earn a lot of revenue so you can see that revenue per customer you know eight dollars three and a half dollars these metrics if compared to other tech startups other platforms uh, you know it would not really compare so because banking uh, if you do well it is a highly monetizable business uh, especially if you lend so new banks are also getting a lot of revenue and that's why their valuation you can see the valuation at the bottom very large valuations many of them most of them have become unicorns the big ones that have become successful i believe here you look at the product portfolio right uh, so most of them would have started with one or two products like revolute started with one uh, debit card product that is accepted internationally like cross-border payments but today it is a full-fledged bank offers everything that or otherwise a bank would offer uh, same with monzo or n26 uh, they are expanding uh, into all the peripheral areas of banking as well like today your hdfc bank would have its insurance product and mutual fund product and broking and you know all kinds of prepaid card debit card credit card uh, and loans so neo banks also the their long-term strategy is to mimic a bank and offer these products now these products need not be of the bank itself of the new bank Mostly, they would go and partner uh, with other institutions for lending. They might partner with an NBFC, they might partner with an insurance company or a wealth management company, and then they can offer in collaboration with that partner. So, let's uh, now go into the how neo banking has uh, proceeded in India, right? So, these are some of the metrics, very broad metrics that uh, banking in India has traditionally been very large market and also quite profitable. Right. Uh, so the revenue pool estimated at 12 uh, billion dollars annually. But it has been dominated by few large income and banks. Uh, we talk of SBI, which is by far the largest bank. But then some of the private sector peers like your HDFC, ICICI, and Kotak, they've also done really well and they have a pretty large market share. So that has been the state in in, in for the last 20, 30 years, so to say. Everything changed in 2014 when new licenses, RBI started giving out new licenses. Then uh, two banks, IDFC and Bandhan, got a full-fledged licenses. And then a uh, lot of uh, smaller organizations got uh, small finance bank licenses and payment bank licenses. That sort of brought about competition in the market. And now banks are also trying to innovate and you know, create some differentiation so that they don't lose the market share. Now, in this context, let's look at uh, okay, before we jump into some new bank examples, I want to highlight one point here, which is probably not on the slides. But because banks today are seeing a lot of competition and they are sort of worried that they might lose business uh, to the smaller banks that have come up, they might lose business to the tech giants. Right? Today we have Google and Amazon and Flipkart. Uh, everyone has, uh, or even WhatsApp for that matter, they all have started their payment businesses. They all are offering many products like in Google Pay, you can do half the things that otherwise you, you can do on a mobile app. So large banks today are worried that they may lose some market share, some revenue opportunities. So they are also keen to partner with new banks. And because the you know bank like HDFC, ICICI today cannot work like a startup and cannot uh, maybe build that user experience in that product, they're keen to uh, partner with new banks and then compete with the likes of Google and uh, WhatsApp and uh, Facebook. So I have taken the examples and the products of few new banks just to give you a flavor of what's been happening in India. So Neo already we give some uh, background, right? So we started in 2015 and three large businesses we have. Uh, one is that uh, zero forex markup travel card. Uh, the problem statement I talked about earlier that when you travel abroad you find it difficult to pay 
uh, you go to different countries you have to take different uh, forex cards like if you go to europe and then you're going to switzerland and uk and germany so maybe you have to load a swiss franc and a euro and a pound and so many currencies have to load. it becomes very cumbersome so we have a zero forex markup travel card where you load in indian rupees you can spend anywhere uh, we have a prepaid card for blue colored working classes so that acts like a salary account and then we have a uh, full-fledged savings account uh, with idfc bank as you can see uh, the new banks are all partnering with banks right right in india digital banking licenses are not available so you have to sort of partner uh, with the bank then there is a uh, bank open which is an sme focused new bank uh, the other problem statement that i spoke about earlier uh, smes find it difficult to manage their books of accounts to have in business loans or to manage their payments so open has bundled all of these software solutions uh, such as your payment gateway your accounting software your, uh, your salary payment module your attendance module all of this it has bundled and then it has taken a savings account from icici bank and the whole package it is giving to an sme at a subscription cost annually Uh, there are a few others. So new and open are actually uh, three, four years old now. They are operational. Uh, the others have just started in the last one year because there has been so much interest and we saw a lot of new banks uh, getting open. So Yellow Finance actually uh, operates in the same business that we do in one of our businesses, the prepaid card for blue colored employees and SMEs. So they're trying to create a digital banking platform for working classes, uh, blue colored employees in SMEs. And then eventually they want to offer other solutions such as your uh, healthcare solutions, affordable healthcare solutions, affordable micro insurance product, lending product, wealth management products. Uh, to these financially excluded and uh, what we call Bharat, right? There is India that lives in the cities, metros, and then there is Bharat who are maybe living in tier two cities, working in factories. Uh, they are all migrant workers. So Yellow is trying to build a banking platform for them. Uh, there is Jupiter, uh, founded by a very renowned ex-founder uh, from PayU. Uh, so Jupiter is aiming to build a digital banking platform, which offers a very nice and uh, superior experience. And that's what they uh, they are marketing themselves as. And they they have tied up with a very uh, Yellow, for example, has tied up with ICICI Bank. Jupiter also has tied up with a very large bank, and they are uh, planning to launch their card uh, very soon uh, this year. So it will be a debit card and a savings account and then there will be a lot of innovative features like your reward platform or your referral program and all of that so these are some examples there are a few others more but there's not much differentiation so to say everyone is trying to build uh, something for uh, the millennials or younger generation students and uh, you know working classes young young working population so that's that's the use case for them any queries so far uh, on the Indian examples? So I'll, I'll post a couple of questions. There are a few more which we'll, we'll hold off till the end. But uh, one question, for example, is um, how do you manage regulations uh, in, in the Indian context? Is there any license that is required for new banks to look at? Yeah. Okay. Very interesting question. So the regulator in India does not recognize something as a new bank. The regulator has been pretty uh, strong and harsh in coming down on some of them, like we also actually stopped promoting ourselves as Neo Bank. So the regulator says that there are certain licenses already available, right? Uh, if you want to lend, you have to get an NBFC license. If you want to have your own prepaid card or a wallet, you take a what is called a PPI license, a prepaid instrument. These are the two licenses uh, on the payment side and lending side. If you want to uh, distribute insurance products, it is very easy to get an insurance distributorship. Similarly, you can become a mutual fund distributorship. So licenses are fragmented, right? And different regulators are giving different licenses. There is no umbrella digital banking or neo banking license, so to say. And all the examples that we talked about, uh, at the core, they are not regulated. They are working as technology platforms. Now, you may ask that how are they offering bank accounts? How are they taking deposits? So in the eyes of RBI, the customer is of the partner bank. Like today, if we if I open a savings account, I say that it's in partnership with IDFC Bank, and the customer is actually reported by IDFC Bank uh, to RBI. So the money, the deposit is lying with the bank. Uh, all the compliance and reporting, it is the responsibility of the bank. 
Any other query? Yeah, perfect. I'll, I'll add one more, which is similar to what you're mentioning. And a couple of people have actually asked this, that how do you build trust with the consumer given there's no physical presence of, of your brand as such? Uh, uh, you know, there's a sense of security that gets attached to a physical presence where customers can personally go and speak to someone. Um, so how do you address that? I think you were partially talking about uh, your partnership model, but I don't know if you'd like to just address that as well. Yeah, again, a very uh, significant challenge for any uh, new bank, at least when they start, uh, because the brand is not well known. So you can uh, sort of solve it in multiple ways. One obviously is that you uh, leverage your partner bank's brand. Uh, so all the collaterals, be it your debit card or the kit that comes to you, it has the logo of the bank, uh, the terms and conditions, emailers, it all mentions that uh, we are partnered with this bank, your money is actually applying with this bank and it is very uh, safe and secure. Right. We had actually partnered with Yes Bank, right? And then uh, during the Yes Bank crisis, there was a lot of customer issue, trust issues. But ultimately, the deposits in India are sort of secured by RBI. There is a deposit uh, insurance a given, deposit a guarantee given up to 5 lakhs now, I think. So we heavily uh, sort of communicate that to the customer that any balance up to 5 lakhs is guaranteed by RBI because it is lying in bank accounts. Now, for initial uh, sort of customer acquisition, uh, it depends a lot on uh, what to word, word of mouth marketing or viral marketing. Like for example, our uh, travel card, the global card, we initially gave it to a select set of customers like friends and family and some uh, pilot segment. They used it when they travel abroad and then they uh, referred their custom, uh, their friends, family members, colleagues, and then it became like that, right? At the onset to offer a savings account and ask for deposits, it's a big challenge uh, to get uh, customers money. So then you have to create some, uh, or you have to have word of mouth marketing as well. You have to have customer referrals, and then you continuously build your brand and invest uh, in, in uh, campaigns, promotions. And it is not entirely true that there is no physical presence. Most of them, especially in SME segment or blue colored worker segment, we have a very large sales team. Like Neo has a 500 member sales team. So we are present physically uh, at their workplaces. We go and meet the customer uh, where they work in the factories, SMEs. We have sales team reaching there. Same is with say Bank Open or same with Yellow. Uh, because in the segment of say SMEs or blue collared workers, it becomes uh, challenging uh, to initially have digital acquisition. Perfect, thanks. I think the last one, and maybe this might uh, segue into your next section of, about the business model itself, is around in your partnership model with a with a base bank. What is the distribution of risk between you and, and your partner bank, be it in terms of say credit risk or operational risk? Okay. So in terms of credit risk, uh, typically banks ask for something like an FLDG model, which is like first uh, uh, loan, first default uh, is guaranteed. Right, first loss uh, guarantee, or it can be a sharing of the risk also, because uh, the asset or the loan will be on the balance sheet of the bank. Uh, it is the responsibility of the bank to collect, but some credit uh, risk or loss can be shared with the fintech partner as well. Uh, for operational risk, as I said, cash is more or less eliminated from the ecosystem, so there is no cash risk. Uh, if there are incidences of fraud and other uh, sort of operation risk issues, it depends on at whose end it was created and then uh, sort of uh, that party takes takes the brunt of it, right? Uh, I would say operation risk is not a huge risk for new bank because they are branchless and uh, more or less cashless. Uh, Everything is happening digitally. Uh, there can be very large cyber security risk too. And that's why all these kind of certifications and information security protocols become very important. Perfect, thanks. I think there are a couple of questions on the model itself. So you possibly after you've covered your next section, I can I can pose the next set of questions. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Very so this is a snapshot from of uh, how the neo banking ecosystem works. As I said, at the core, you know, uh, there is a neo banking layer which is managed by the fintech startup, and then all these components are actually usually provided by the bank, which provides a base infrastructure, be it your payment gateway or your uh, interbank settlement system, right, or uh, providing access to uh, you know NPCI's uh, Rupee platform or NFS switch, right. All the infrastructural components come from the bank, 
and then your bank more or less builds a middle layer and a front end layer uh, and uh, on the customer actually sees only the neo bank it sees the mobile application and all the products are managed by the neo bank so there will be different modules and for uh, different modules neo bank can partner with different partners right it can you can partner with an nbfc for lending you can partner with a uh, third party insurance player or a mutual fund player right so there are b2b and b2c models and then uh, at the right side we have all the customer segments so we already covered that it can be an sme it can be a travel industry player travel agent it can be uh, students or uh, working classes like business travelers so it can be different customer segments either b2b or b2c uh, again this is a different view in terms of how the platform works right as i said at the end, bottom you can see the bank which uh, provides something what that you call a bin Right. To issue a card, you need a bin, which is which only a bank can get in India. Right, you get it from Visa, certified by Visa, Mastercard, Rupee, and then your card is accepted everywhere. Then we have interbank settlement. Your NEFT, RTGS, IMTS, UPI, all these settlements happen through a bank, and you have to manage the customers' accounts uh, and report that to RBI. So these components are taken care of the bank. Then you have the new banking layer. Uh, so new bank is uh, sort of communicating with with the bank through a set of apis all these products are consumable by apis and at the top you see the front end application this is like a mobile app uh, where all the products are visible to the customer it's a completely a partnership model uh, with the bank and a new bank right and the idea here is to not just build one or two products but an ecosystem around the customer so that uh, you know you can be, bring in different uh, products and service offerings. So broadly, the new banking strategy in India is like this, right? You have to first partner with the bank because, as I said, licenses are not available. Deposits can only be held in bank accounts. And uh, if you don't have a partner bank, it uh, has creates issues around trust and stability and security also for customers. So it's very critical to have a partner bank. Then the user experience, customer experience becomes uh, super critical uh, because the entire proposition is uh, seamless, easy to use, uh, and uh, you can do banking sitting at home. So your user experience, UI, UX is very critical. And lastly, you have to find your niche segment where uh, you know your offering is much better than a bank. So there are pockets of very large untapped market, right? Some of the segments I talked about. So it is not a uniform one size fits all. Uh, we're highlighting again on in terms of the customer experience and convenience, right? So a large section of customers feel that their finances, their needs are really uh, well understood, better managed by a new bank or fintech uh, rather than a regular bank. So customer experience is really the core uh, USP of a new bank. Experience and convenience. So convenience means that your bank is available on uh, at your fingerprint uh, like i'll just give a small example at neo like if you have a ticket or you want to reach your customer care you don't have to call and go through an ivr you can just whatsapp and then a ticket gets logged and it, it is visible on the app so all of us must have uh, had this very painful experience of trying to reach a call center in a bank and be on an ivr loop for 20 minutes so new banks don't operate like that uh, like it is much simplified. There are chat bots, for example. You can type your query, and if the answer is simple, you, the bot will reply, or an agent will immediately pick up the call. The processes are very simplified. Uh, process have been built uh, from scratch, and so none of these legacy issues uh, come up. Right? Typically, if you visit a bank branch and it's a slightly complicated issue, they will say, oh, "We have to reach our head office. We have to get this approval, that approval." The new banks don't have such uh, complex processes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our marketing strategy, right? Uh, there is a lot of focus on customer referral and uh, engagement. Uh, so leaders like Revolut, they get more than 80% of their acquisitions through referrals. So that really brings down the cost to acquire a customer. Uh, you would not find a new bank cold calling you, sending you a lot of emailers. That the kind of issues that typically we as a customer we see with banks right for example i i have an account with hdfc i have a credit card i'll still have some agents calling me and trying to pitch me the same product 
right? Banks today have this issue because they are employing third parties, uh, you know, uh, referral agents. So the customer experience is not uniform. But a new bank has a very strong control on that. Typically, they would not uh, have bombardment of offers or cold calling and all that. Uh, the campaigns will be very innovative, right? So you try to create some viral marketing strategies. You create a lot of content and engagement, right? Uh, like there is a concept of waitlist nowadays. So, like we had a waitlist running for our IDFC savings account product. Uh, new banks are giving things like a metal card, which is, you know, very rare in India. None of the banks has that. We uh, we have uh, an asset called uh, uh, Neo Zen Community, which is a community of travelers. So some select customers we invite uh, to a cafe, and then we invite them for dinner. And then we have uh, you know people who are who are avid travelers. They come and share their experiences. You will find a lot of these innovative marketing campaigns. Now, why is it such an attractive proposition, uh, both for, let's say, employees or investors and for everyone? One, the market segment is very large, as I say, both in retail and SME. Uh, and beyond a point, it is uh, pretty much profitable, right? Uh, the infrastructure cost initially uh, is low because the infrastructure is more or less provided by the bank. A new bank doesn't have to invest so much on the physical infrastructure. And the integrations with banks tend to be very deep. Uh, there are very strong tech integrations, and uh, the processes also are sort of integrated with the bank. Uh, so this works very well with banks who have adopted open banking architecture. So today there are banks like, say, ICICI Bank or RBA Bank who have really uh, adopted this open API concept. So as new banks, it is pretty uh, easy to sort of work with them. There is a lot of emphasis on customer experience. So younger segments, your millennials and generations, they, they really love that experience because uh, they've uh, they've grown up using uh, experience of Uber and Amazon and Netflix. So if they get the similar experience in a bank, they, they really love it. And the business model has been proven globally. Uh, as we saw, there are very large you know, banks globally. And it is now being customized for India. And lastly, the banks don't see the new banks as competition. They're very happy to collaborate because they are also getting a share of the revenue. So it is a win-win proposition for both banks and, and the new bank. So there are some sort of differences between a traditional model and a new banking model. A traditional, in a traditional model, everything is product-centric, right? You would have different departments handling different products. You would have a uh, deposit product manager, you will have a home loan product manager, Right? And all the architecture, tech architecture, processes, organizations are built around those uh, business heads and those product uh, teams. Uh, a new bank takes a platform-centric approach. Right, It looks at the customer as a whole and sees that what all can I provide. And the offering need not be even financial. Right, Banks today are constrained by the regulator that they can't really offer non-financial products. But in, as a new bank, I can offer a learning, e-learning module or a healthcare uh, product to my customer. So it is more like a marketplace. Uh, a new bank is uh, really data-driven business. There's a lot of emphasis on customer data segmentation. And the organization is also designed around the customer. Uh, there won't be business-based silos. In new bank. So uh, theoretically, it can be said as a banking as a platform. Like today we have uh, software as a platform or such platforms. Here we are offering the entire bank and its offerings as a tech platform. I'll try to sort of skip this because we talked about how new banks operate in terms of business model. Now looking ahead, uh, you know, what does the future look like in a new bank? So overall bankable population in India is, uh, you know, as I said, 500, 600 million today. Uh, so new banks can target to reach about 50% in the next three to four years. Today, it is not even 5% uh, of the bank population. But you know how uh, the progress has been in the last two, three years, at least 50% of that bank population can be addressed by new banks. Uh, now, uh, any questions so far on, on the business model? Oh uh, yes, actually, um, just just posting a few. So uh, we look at both the revenue side and the cost side, just from that perspective. So as you had mentioned earlier, one of the key revenue drivers is the subscription model that you have. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, the core of that is the is the customer. And you, as you uh, uh, you know very strongly pointed out, the the customer experience becomes the central piece in that whole in that whole model. Uh, yes. Now, one is the customer experience in terms of UX, and the other one is also the services that you provide customers. And you also had a slide where you talked about the different kinds of services, and there, there seem to be some commonalities across neobanks in terms of the kinds of services, be it say transaction-based services, cross-border transaction, or account opening facilities. So, uh, one one question here is um, Neo as as a business, um, how did what was your roadmap? How did you all decide which space to to, to get into, or how have you identified what customer services really are relevant? Do you all have, say, a, a separate department that, that looks at customer experience and is constantly evolving that? What, what is your approach? Okay. Okay, pretty interesting. So, actually, at NEO, we have had a, quite a few pivots in terms of business model. So, uh, in 2015, we started off as a tax benefit uh, product, uh, like what Zeta does today in India. So, we had a multi wallet. Uh, tax benefit card and a product for uh, employees of MNCs, large companies. Uh, so today, uh, the salary that you receive, um, you, there are a lot of allowances in the Income Tax Act that uh, makes it tax deductible. Like you have your travel allowance and food allowance and uh, uniform allowance. There's a lot of uh, some 10, 12 allowances, uh, but it is very difficult for a large company to manage all of this. So. So they just give the entire salary to the bank account. And as an employee to furnish those bills and manage, keep track of that, it, it is again cumbersome. So most employees are not able to avail that benefit. So we had that product wherein uh, the tax exam component of, of your salary it doesn't go to your savings account. It comes to the new uh, prepaid card. And then uh, we had uh, built in uh, those uh, integration that when you spend at a uh, restaurant, for example, automatically money gets deducted from your food wallet. Likewise, when you uh, maybe travel in an Uber uh, for your work, so that money gets deducted from your travel wallet. So that was the product we started off. But we realized that it's not a very big market and Income Tax Act is getting simplified every year. We sort of moved away from that product, right? And then we created that uh, salary account, prepaid salary account for blue colored employees. We created that right after demonetization. We saw a huge opportunity that now the government is mandating that even SMEs have to pay their salaries on bank accounts. They can't pay in cash. Earlier they were paying wages, daily wages in cash. So we started that business and we had really grown that business. Then we uh, saw that uh, our tax program, uh, tax benefit program, many customers are using our card internationally, right? Uh, for cross border payments. And then we did some customer survey. We found out that. Uh, you know, we were actually maybe uh, coincidentally with we our product, it is running on Visa and we're not charging uh, any Forex markup, right? So the customers found that there is a value to it. And uh, the money was also secure because it's a prepaid card and Neo was offering a lock unlock facility on its app. So if they lost the card or if there is any suspicious trans- transaction, they will just lock the card on the mobile app. So then we realized that, okay, it's a big opportunity. Why don't we start a Forex card business? Now, uh, today, uh, like this year, when the pandemic hit, we that business is completely come to a halt. There is no travel happening. So we, we thought that why don't we create a, a modify the product and create something that can be used uh, throughout the year and not just when you travel abroad. So we tied up with IDFC Bank and we have now created this savings account product. So we have retained all the core features of our travel product, like zero forest markup, lock and lock. We have something like an ATM locator. But we also are now giving 7% interest on the balances. And then we have built a lot of domestic use cases. So that's how we have evolved over the years and maybe uh, shut down one or two business and move into different businesses. But we could do that because our uh, product infrastructure, tech infrastructure that is in-house and we could leverage that and quickly roll out a new product. Well, thank uh, you, that's really interesting yeah, in terms of being able to uh, pivot into different pieces so quickly. I think that also is a key differentiator for fintechs like yourselves versus the more traditional players. Uh, just one more question before you move into your last few slides. So we spoke about the revenue side. On the cost side, like you mentioned, your traditional cost of acquisition, customer cost of acquisition drivers aren't really applicable to your bank. Uh, yes. However, you, you, you showed us a slide earlier with uh, the international players and there was still, uh, compared to say the average revenue per customer, there was still a, quite a substantial average cost per customer as well. Um, so any any um, 
uh, like any theoretical ideas on what what are the key drivers from a from a cost standpoint uh, for new banks, and how do you guys then balance that out with your strategy? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, even though uh, there is no branch, there is no physical infrastructure cost, but new banks tend to manage their technology in house. Uh, so there will be an initial uh, infra tech infrastructure cost, uh, be it in terms of servers or uh, other software that you have uh, uh, sort of licensed, and there will be a large component of people cost because it's, the team will be heavy on product managers, in-house uh, techies and designers and like that, and in-house marketing team, right? And also, as is a trend, uh, the typical wages, salaries also will tend to be higher than a bank employees' salaries, right? So people cost is very large, uh, and uh, specifically in India, there is a very large ATM cost component because we are offering atm transactions so some free transactions per month so we have to take that cost this becomes a uh, primary cost drivers uh, but these are significant only at a smaller scale now as uh, a new bank gets more and more customers the cost heads don't really scale up that fast so that's how the business becomes much more uh, the unit economics is much more favorable and positive in nature right uh, new banks yeah. typically are in in the game of giving a lot of uh cashbacks or rewards like what you would see payment players like a paytm provide uh, everyone is trying to buy for the same customer so they're giving a lot of rewards and cashbacks in your banks it is much less uh, in comparison so that kind of acquisition cost isn't there perfect one last question then we can move on to your final slides uh, like you've, you've extensively spoken about and especially in india of course the partnership model is almost mandatory uh, uh, but do you, what, how, how does that relationship work in some cases? So there's a specific question where you said on the one hand, of course, there's a clear understanding of what your partner banks gain from partnering with, with, with an organization like NEO in terms of customer acquisition and customer experience. But on the other hand, banks also have their own uh, you know, vision to create their own digital services and their own online services. Is there a, um, is there a, are those antagonistic forces or is it still more collaborative and banks are not looking, are looking at this partnership as, as more favorable? Okay, I think very interesting question and then uh, different banks do have their different roadmaps. So what uh, we have witnessed so far is that uh, the banks who are the most keen to partner with neo banks aren't really the market leaders. They are what we call challenger banks, right? So the banks that are not really an HDFC or ICICI, uh, younger banks, uh, right? Like your ES bank or your IDFC bank or in the same bank. So they are the challenger banks they want to capture market share very quickly they want to capture primarily they want to capture a lot of casa customers deposit accounts so they feel that it is much more uh, favorable for them to partner with new bank and create a proposition that is different than the market and you wouldn't really see an sbr or an hdfc bank having a very large new banking partnership they might partner on some products peripheral products but on products that they are very strong at like your savings account or your forex card they wouldn't want to cannibalize their product. Now, the partners that we had, for example, like IDFC Bank uh, was a very large NBFC and they got the license like five, six years ago. And now they're trying to build a robust deposit franchise. So they feel that, okay, if we partner with Mio and we can get a lot of savings account customers from, from this slightly different segment, right? Our segment, target segments are millennials, students, young professionals, people in the age group of 20 to 35. So these people, this segment wouldn't want to go to branches and you know, stand in a queue and open accounts. They would look for digital alternatives. And so for such use cases, such products, we aren't really competing with the bank at all. Right? Or take the example of Forex card business. Now we have partnered with DCB Bank. Now DCB doesn't have a Forex card business or a credit card business. Uh, so they're very happy that we are bringing them those customers. Uh, because the market leaders are Axis Bank, HDFC, ICIC. So you wouldn't find an Axis or an HDFC partnering with us for a Forex card kind of product, right? So banks also pick and choose which uh, products, which businesses they want to partner with in your bank. Okay, thanks. I think uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you move on with the rest of your slides. And then we'll go into the, the final segment we usually cover is the career segment. So I'll, I'll uh, start posting some questions. Okay, my next slide is actually about some of the career opportunities in Neo banks. Uh, if there is any other query on the business model of neobanks, we'll be happy to answer that. 
Uh, no, I think we can move into this. Okay. So I have only taken some of the uh, more popular career choices, not all. Uh, obviously, in any organization, you will have roles like HR and finance and sales. Uh, but those verticals I haven't really picked up here. Uh, so as in uh, in any startup, uh, in fintechs also, product management is a very critical role. Uh, it is more or less a techno-functional role, uh, which uh, we have seen uh, MBAs also take up that role and also uh, techies from premier colleges like engineers from say IITs or BITs, they also become product managers. So here you need to have a blend of your technical skills as well as your business skills, right? So a product manager would conduct market research, right? You try to understand, uh, you know, what, what are the offerings. You do consumer surveys and uh, get all the feedback in terms of what is the customer need. Then you'll translate all of that and create a set of product specifications. What you called uh, create a lot of user journeys and wireframes, right? Uh, and then he would work with the tech team, explain the specifications to the tech team, who would be in charge of actually uh, delivering that product. Uh, eventually, a product manager is expected to own different metrics like the takeoff of the product, how many customers are signing up for this product, what are the growth metrics, uh, and then uh, go to market of that product. And in large companies, some cases, senior product managers, they take care of the PL also. So, what is the revenue that is coming from that product? Uh, in a way, it is similar to what a product manager does in an e commerce firm also. Then we come to technology, which is again uh, large. A chunk of the employees are in the tech platform. So you would have front end developers who, uh, who are, who are uh, you know, creating APIs and then, uh, you know, consuming APIs from the banks. Uh, then we have back end developers who create the core platform. Uh, there, there are also full stack developers. So, especially in early stage startups, they can work across front end and back end. And then there is a lot of demand for uh, mobile app de uh, developers like Android and iOS developers also. Uh, design is a very critical theme for new banks because there is a lot of emphasis on user experience, UI, UX. So we have a uh, user experience researcher who again does a lot of customer surveys, finds out uh, what, what should they look and feel, what are the features the customer is looking for. Then a de UI designer is actually creating that, you know, he is translating the specifications from the product manager into a uh, app screen. Right. We have digital marketing team, uh, which is very significant. Right. So there is a role called growth hacker, especially for early stage swing takes or when a new product is launched, we have to right, sort of be like a hustler and, you know, uh, uh, don multiple hats and do different kind of activities at different stages, more or less like a uh, you know, one man army sometimes for launching a new product. We have campaign managers, so they create a lot of digital campaigns. Facebook campaigns, Google AdWord campaigns. And then we have like a mix of business team, strategy team. Like, so there will be founders of phase or chief of staff who work with the founders, uh, you know, work on investor uh, presentations, fundraising, and a lot of cross-functional initiatives. So uh, cross-functional and special projects, right? There is, there is a strong need for project management, what we call PMO, project management office. Then there will be people who would look after alliances, so the new bank is a lot about alliance alliances also you can't create the products in house so you would go and partner with a lot of players and then uh, build these third party alliances so that was about the different roles and opportunities if i talk about skill sets technology it is like you know uh, very well understood in design you need to have a design degree or diploma marketing product manager usually mbas uh, same for strategy and uh, business function also. Any queries on this? I guess there will be queries. Uh, no, thanks. Yeah, a couple. And uh, first of all, um, really interesting because, you know, in the last few sessions, while uh, some of the themes you mentioned uh, have been echoed by other fintechs you've had, I think the design piece where you explicitly call it is really interesting. We haven't really heard that very often. Uh, so that's a really interesting piece to, to, to hear. And uh, I think it also ties back into your, your earlier conversation on or the role of customer experience and design in the whole, uh, you know, being at the heart of your business model. So that that is a really interesting point, which I think the students should should take care of. And if anybody has any questions on that, I'm happy to look at that. Uh, I'll also in the meantime post another question. You, you did kind of cover it, but it's it's a very popular question in all our sessions. We we'll explicitly tackle that head on again, where we've got a, a a mix of of folks with a lot of technical background and some who don't have a technical background at all. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so um, is there a core need for having a techie, technology-based background? Or, uh, your side, of course, does mention a few roles that could do without it, but what is, what is your take on the space right now? So technology, like there are a lot of uh, opportunities within tech itself, but otherwise the other functions don't have an explicit need for tech. Now, as a product manager, it always helps to have an understanding of tech because large part of the interaction is with tech team. But that doesn't mean that a product manager needs to be able to create codes or like that. He needs to have an understanding of the technology uh, and he needs to understand what the tech team is trying to convey. But uh, there are also product managers who don't have a tech background. Uh, I've come across both sets. The other roles, honestly, it's not really a technology role, be it a design or a marketing or a business function. Secondly, yeah. specifically for freshers who are coming into this, so who wouldn't really have, um, you know, uh, pre, pre experience in, say, the financial services sector. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind? Do you have any suggestions on areas they should really look at when if they are interviewing with a new bank, or if they're looking at, you know, pursuing such careers? Any specific? Uh, you know, practical areas they should focus on in building themselves. Um, so domain experience is only sort of needed in the last role that I say. Most typically yeah. in a strategy PM role, they either look at people from consulting firms or people who might have worked in other fintechs, uh, right? So have some kind of uh, domain understanding. Uh, the other functions more or less are pretty much uh, fungible. There is no explicit need for domain knowledge. Uh, if product manager, it may help to have, but even if someone is, uh, you know, having experience in other startups uh, as a product manager, that is also, there are people who, who sort of change because the core concepts remain the same. Okay. I think a last question, this is kind of a mixture of questions. One is, uh, uh, like, you know, with the whole pandemic that's happened, uh, there's been a real switch in terms of, and you also talked about how you, well, have had to pivot into new areas, uh, but have you also seen a change in the kind of roles and skill sets? Like uh, amongst the, the the roles you've mentioned right now, are there any specific roles that are even more important to the stage, or is it pretty much the same regardless? I think uh, the emphasis on digital skill sets became much more pronounced after the pandemic. A uh, lot of fintech earlier they might be having say dependence on sales function or physical presence, mm -hmm. right? But now everyone has realized that. Uh, their customer acquisition has to happen through digital marketing. So skill sets on the digital marketing side, growth hackers, uh, design skill sets, they're even more important than, than than ever before, I would say. Right? And also product management is a skill uh, that is in yeah, very uh, high demand, strong demand. Uh, and the skill sets for a product manager here is actually quite different than what is required in a bank. Within a bank, it is a lot to do about stakeholder management and documentation of processes and like that. Here it is actually to create a new product and make it go live. Because a FinTech new bank they would ideally would be creating some product enhancements every quarter. Something or the other new is happening every quarter. Perfect thank I think that covers pretty much most of the questions. Thank you so much for Okay, I'll stop sharing and if there is any more query Happy to take that. No, oh, no, but no, but really, uh, we really appreciate you taking out the time for this. I think we had a really refreshing session, really getting a practical perspective on uh, not only the space and the the business model. I think you really went into a level of depth that the students have really gained from. Uh, apart from the fact that I think your uh, your perspective on the career opportunities is something the students on the call really gained from, and they can take away some of the skills that they're looking at. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your time today. Um, and, and thank you to all the students. I think uh, really glad to continue to see very active participation. You know, the, the questions we saw today uh, were very relevant and important and uh, happy to see the, the participants sticking around and, uh, and being active. Um, and as, we, as we always say, you know, this, this whole piece is designed around being able to help you in pursuing your careers in the FinTech space. Uh, so if you have any comments, suggestions on how we run these, uh, these sessions, or any uh, suggestions on on further for the topics you'd like to cover, or if you have any specific questions that you'd like us to pass on to Rajdeep and uh, get some more perspective, we're happy to do that as well. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, please please keep joining in. Uh, please keep giving us your perspective, and and look forward to to having you all in the in the next sessions to come.
Thank you again, Rajiv. Uh, uh, really um, glad that you could uh, the participate in today's session and look forward to future collaboration with you. Thank you so much, Abneesh. Pleasure uh, attending this session. Thank you to everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.